Welcome to episode 62 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm interviewing writer-director Mark Lawrence. Mark recently wrote and directed a film called The Rewrite, starring Hugh Grant and Marissa Tomei. He's had a long career in the entertainment industry, starting out as a writer on the hit television show Family Ties and starting to write feature films in the 90s and into the 2000s. He had a big hit called Miss Congeniality in the early 2000s and has continued to write and direct feature films. So we have a nice conversation about his recent movie and kind of how he got into the industry. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help out, so thank you everybody who does those. A couple of quick notes. Any website or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts and then just look for, for then just look for episode number sixty two. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell a screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Also, a quick plug about the new SYS screenwriting analysis service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional script evaluation on your script. All the readers have experience reading for studios, production companies, or contests. The readers I've partnered with are the gatekeepers. They're exactly the same people who are going to read your scripts at the companies that you submit to. The readers will evaluate your script on several key factors like concept and premise, structure, character, dialogue, and marketability. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend. Also, as a bonus, if you get a recommend from two readers, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast I use myself to promote my scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking to make movies. Also, you can read a quick bio on each reader and pick the one you'd like to read your script and pick the one who you would like to read your read your script. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants to find out more. A quick few words about what I'm working on. So the producer who has my low budget horror script, which I've mentioned several times on this podcast, it's a low budget um, horror script that I optioned a couple of times to him. He has a connection with another producer who has a comic book property optioned. He called me the other day and wanted to know if I would write him a 10 to 12 page treatment based on this comic book. This is actually pretty, a pretty common situation. It's basically the producer wanting me to write something for no upfront money on the slim hope that he'll be able to get this thing funded. If this other producer likes our take on the material, he may or may not hire us to write and produce this property. So it's just, it's highly speculative. But if you're in Hollywood and you're pushing your scripts around and you're meeting producers, you're going to run into these types of situations quite a lot. So I thought I would just run to sort of my thought processes. Maybe it can help you in, in your own um, thought process and your own thinking as you get faced with these types of situations. So with this type of situation, um, there are a couple things that I like to consider. Number one, and this is really the most important thing to consider, is you know who is the producer asking me to basically write something for free? In this case, as a producer, I like him. Um, he has quite a number of recent credits on his resume, so I know he can get stuff done. And this is very, very important because you're going to get a lot of people asking you to do stuff for free that have no credits, and you know. A lot of these people are well-meaning and they might be hard-working, but you really need to 
carefully weigh, you know, the value of doing something like that versus the value of just writing something on spec for yourself and having that script to send out yourself. So that's really the most important, I would say that's really the key. No, there's two keys. I, I want to make sure that I actually like the producer that I'm working with. And then second, I want to make sure that this producer really is a real producer who has credits. And this guy's got a bunch of credits. They're recent credits. They're films that are similar to the films that I've written. So I kind of feel like our careers are at similar levels. He's not, you know, too much ahead of me. He's not too far behind me. And this is important. You know, you do want to kind of meet people and work with people that are kind of, you know, at your same level or maybe a little bit above. That's really going to be the best relationship. Ultimately, though, since this is no upfront money and it's highly speculative, I basically know that I'm just doing this producer a favor, which is fine. As I said, I like him. He's got credits. And I feel like when when and if he does get some money for a project, um, because I've been helping him out, he's pretty likely to bring me on as a writer. He seems to like my writing. We seem to get along pretty well. And as I said, he's got some real credit. So I know at some point in the near future, he will get some movies funded and he will need some writers to write those movies to maybe rewrite. Maybe he'll have a script. Maybe he'll have a property. He'll need some rewrites. So, you know, getting a building a relationship with this producer, I think, is worth doing. I mean, this business is all about relationships. So at some point you've got to build the, build some relationships and really try and foster them. So that's kind of my thinking with this. Now, the second big issue that I look at is how much work is this going to be for me? I actually don't think writing a 10 page treatment will take me more than about six hours. So that's not in my, at least in my opinion, that's not a lot of time to do something for free. I mean, you hear about this all the time where, you know, studios bring writers in to pitch on their take. I mean, you're going to spend just for a pitch meeting like that, a, you know, a high level pitch meeting, you're probably going to spend more than six hours kind of working this up. So I don't think this is going to take that long. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I read the first three episodes of this comic last night, and there's actually a bunch more of, of more, um, ep there's more, more comics I have to read. So there'll actually be more, um, more material that I can draw from. But the thing is, is just in reading these first three episodes, I feel like there's some really strong story elements that I will be able to use in the script. And this is important. Um, I think a lot of ways this is going to be like a big cut and paste job where I just take the elements from the comic and, you know, I'm going to need to restructure them. I'm going to need to combine some, throw some away, enhance them, you know, remove characters, add characters. There's going to be definitely some changes, but there's a lot of story elements that are already there in the comic. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, it's not like starting from scratch or it's not like starting from, you know, just a simple like half page treatment and trying to flush it out to a 12 page treatment where I've got to come up with a lot of story beats. Um, there's a lot of good material, a lot of really good visual action fight scenes, um, a lot of good stuff that I think will work well in the screenplay. So it just is a matter of combining them. Interestingly, the, the the first three episodes of this particular comic, that's like one complete story, kind of it's one arc. And, um, you know, looking at it, I thought I originally bought those three comics and I thought that might be enough to flesh out to a full screenplay and interestingly I think it can work as a screenplay those first three episodes but it's actually very very sparse there's actually not that much um, I mean I think these these are only about 20 or 22 pages I think 22 pages is the standard and they seem these seem like standard comic books as I said these first three episodes are one arc um, and but it's and I think it, it's a good story with a good beginning middle and end but it's so lean and there's not really that much there that I'm going to need to read some more of these comics and bring some of the other stories from other comics and try and combine them and weave them together to be able to flush this out to a full screenplay and even a full treatment. So that's where I am with that. That's kind of my thinking. Um, as I said, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Um, even though there's no money, it is very speculative, but, um, I think it's worth doing. I think it's a fun project. That's the other consideration that I do is, you know, how much fun is this going to be? Is this going to be enjoyable? If you're not going to make any money off something up front and in, in the entertainment industry, if there's no up, upfront money, that means there's probably no money ever. So, you know, keep that in mind and, and don't go into these things thinking, well, I'm going to make some money down the road because I would say the chances of making some money down the road are slim to none. And I know that going into this, but you know, I'm going to get to meet some of these other producers. I'm going to get to work with this other producer who I like. I think the project is a cool project. I enjoyed reading the comics and I think I'm going to enjoy kind of flushing this out to a treatment and I don't think it's going to take that much time. So combine all those things and, and it's a kind of a thumbs up for me. So I'm going to go ahead and, and try and whip up a treatment here in the next week or two. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm talking with writer and director Mark Lawrence. Here is the interview. 
Welcome, Mark, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's my pleasure, and thanks for having me. So to start out, I wonder if you can just give us sort of a quick overview of how you broke into the business. Um, you know, take us through those post-college years, you know, as you got out of college, moved to Hollywood and broke in and kind of maybe just tell us how you got that first break. Okay. Uh, I was a uh, literature major in college, but I didn't take any screenwriting courses or any film classes or anything like that. Uh, I always wrote, but I hadn't shown anything to anyone, and I was writing sort of little skits and sketches and some really lousy short stories and that kind of thing. But uh, I didn't know anybody who worked in film or television. I didn't know anyone who knew anyone who did it. So it was it was not uh, even something that seemed like any kind of viable career path. So when I graduated college, I went to law school for a year. And um, that was, uh, for me, a less than pleasant experience. So uh, <laughs> by the time I got out of there... I knew, A, that I wanted to write, and B, that I would probably rather be living in a box on the street and trying to write than, than be a lawyer. So that kind of set me up well for for uh, knowing what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. How to do it was uh, a little bit a little bit trickier. I um, didn't – this was back in the 80s, and the Internet was not a thing, so it was much harder in certain ways back then than it is now. I didn't have access to scripts. I couldn't go and watch the, you know, DVDs to the office and watch the extras and, and hear writers talk about how they, you know, crafted a show or, and, and that sort of stuff. So I bought a book, um, I guess that had like screenplay format and I and or or script format and I and I went and started writing a script about my college experience and the off campus house I lived in and I finished the script. And this was kind of pre computer days. I mean, people may have had computers, but you didn't see anyone walking around with laptops or I don't think there were laptops. So I was typing it and uh, finished it and went and had about 80 copies made. And there was a book at the time called The Writer's Market, which I guess may still exist. I don't know. But that had listings of every agency in Hollywood and production company and that sort of stuff. And so I shoved them all into manila envelopes and sent them out and waited and I think I got all uh seventy eight of them back unread. Not even rejected but just unread and you know would not read solicited unsolicited material, excuse me. And then two of them um got good reactions from or two of them were read and people liked them. One uh was a, a fellow named Jack Rollins, who people may recognize from uh, his name from Woody Allen movies. All Woody mm-hmm. Allen movies are produced by by Jack, and he is just uh, one of the great people in the history of show business. Loves comedy writing for the sake of comedy writing. He he called me and said, uh, I like this, you want to come up and talk? And so that was one of the great meetings of my life, and he gave me the first screenplay I ever saw um, to read. And then the other person who read it was the person who turned out to be my first agent, and she's still an agent and working here in New York, and we're still close. Her name is Marsha Amsterdam. And uh, she liked the script, and she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I guess I'd like to try to write movies and television. And she said, let's start with TV because that's shorter. And she said, what shows do you like? And in college, I really hadn't watched much TV and she said, go watch some TV. So I got a copy of TV Guide, which was how you found out what was on TV back then, and Mm -hmm. um, circled every sitcom that was on and sat and watched on a tiny little black-and-white TV and saw a show called Family Ties and liked it, and I had to wait for the next week uh, because there was no DVR or videotaping and to see it again to try to write down the character names and get familiar with it, and wrote a script for Family Ties, and she sent it out to uh, L.A., and uh, Gary David Goldberg, who created the show, and Michael Whitehorn, who was there writing, and they liked it and flew me out, and I wound up working on that show for the next uh, five years, uh, the course of the whole run of the show, and Mm -hmm. started out as staff writer, and by the end was a supervising producer, and so that was that was the start, and then from there I I, I um, branched into into movies. But it was that was a great way to start because the show 
had an incredible cast. Um, Gary was an amazing mentor and, and, and uh, inspiration to, to writers, and the show turned into uh, a very substantial hit. We were on behind Bill Cosby, and so there was, and back then, before there were a billion channels and you could stream and watch DVDs and everything else, network television was kind of what people watched, so you know, 40 million people would watch the episode. So it was it was mm-hmm. a great, incredible way to start. But uh, I, I started on the show at 24, so it was um, that was that was kind of the beginning for me. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great story. The writers' market is still around. That's actually um, that was sort of my foray into screenwriting as well. Was just mm-hmm. bumping into that book, and um, it is still around and does I think have a section on screenwriting. Um, so let's let's dive into your most recent film, The Rewrite. Um, to start out, maybe you can just give us a quick log line for people that maybe haven't seen the trailer or don't know anything about the film. Maybe you can just kind of pitch it to us. Sure. Um, Hugh plays uh, a screenwriter who had won an Oscar for a very popular film in 1999 and had been the toast of the town. And uh, since then, bit by bit, uh, his career has gone downhill. And along with his finances and his family life, he's divorced. He has pretty much lost contact with his son. And uh, at the beginning of the movie, we see him trying to pitch story ideas unsuccessfully to a bunch of executives who are all younger than him. And uh, with no options, his agent uh, finds him a job teaching screenwriting at a college in Binghamton, New York, which he has never heard of. He has no interest in being a teacher. He doesn't believe you can teach screenwriting. And uh, the only reason he goes is because he's out of money and he figures, well, I can go there and not really do anything and get paid and write the next script. Uh, So he's really out of options. Mm -hmm. And he heads out there and when he's there, um, he meets uh, people who will change his life from uh, Marissa Tomei's character, who is sort of a blue collar local single mom. Uh, who has gone back to school and is taking his course to uh, Allison Janney's character, who's a Jane Austen scholar and a professor at the school who very much resents having somebody like you teaching there, to J.K. Simmons, who's the head of the department, who likes Hugh, uh, likes Hugh's character but realizes he's not yet a teacher, and Chris Elliott is his next-door neighbor and a Shakespeare professor. And then, uh, of course, he has... The entire interaction with his screenwriting class, who he initially chooses based on how good looking they are on the university Facebook, um, mm-hmm. and eventually winds up actually uh, getting involved with their with their writing and their creativity and and, and their lives. So that's the, that's the sort of basic rundown, I guess. Mm-hmm. Perfect, perfect. So let's dive into some sort of craft, you know, some craft um, maybe lessons from from this. Um, from this movie, one of the things your protagonist Keith Michaels, played by Hugh Grant, one of the things about him is he's at the beginning he's you know obviously a very flawed protagonist, and I didn't feel like he was all that you know likable or relatable. Now that set up a good transformation and a good arc, and I'm curious. There's always the conventional wisdom that you want the flawed protagonist, which clearly this guy was flawed, but you also want to make him sort of likable and relatable. And I wonder just what was your thought process? Take us through that thought process of creating this character. Character and, you know, making him not too unlikable or completely unlikable or, you know, maybe just give us sort of your thought process when you were coming up with this protagonist. Well, you know, if, if you're in, in, in my case, in a situation like this where I've discussed the movie with an actor with Hugh in this case, and then he's seen the script and wants to do it. That figures into, uh, to some extent, how you shape a character like that, because I remember, to go back to Family Ties for a second, um, Michael J. Fox played the, um, the character on that, on that show, Alex Keaton, who was uh, sort of a slightly, he was a, a, a money-hungry um, Republican, slightly elitist character, and he was just beloved by people. Um, and there was a, a week where Michael was sick or I can't remember what, so that we had to have a stand in come in, uh, an actor come in so that we could block and, and, and the rest of the actors could learn the show and we could get the shots ready. And the actor was very competent and very proficient, but it was strange because hearing those lines coming out of someone's 
someone else's mouth, the character just felt obnoxious and just completely unlikable. And even though the show had already been on for years and was a hit, we went back to the writing room and we were really thrown, like, what you know, what should we do? How do we fix this? And you realize that's part of that interaction. So Hugh, by his nature and, and, and as an actor, what he puts forth can, can, can make some of this stuff interesting and entertaining and, and uh, likable in a, in a way that another actor might not. So the combination of, of knowing that, yes, I'd like him to have enough flaws so it's interesting and we can watch how he works through that over the course of the film, but at the same time, I don't want people to, I, I want them to be, uh, they don't have to absolutely be on his side from the beginning of the film, but I think that they have to be empathetic and actually most importantly entertained because if mm-hmm. they're entertained by him and his flaws, then they will go on the journey. So that's really the thought process there. And it really becomes just as a writer, is it interesting to me? Is it entertaining to me? If it's going over a line, I hope I know it as as we're moving through the script. So you're trying to make those decisions as you go. But um, I mean, for us, the you know, he he has a, a an ill-advised relationship to, with a student that he's teaching and that sort of stuff. And we were worried, oh, is that going to be too much for the audience, or will it will it turn people against him in, in the film? But it it actually those as you mentioned those those sorts of flaws and problem and problems are the things that wind up being the stuff of the film. So mm-hmm. it's always a little bit of a balancing act. But, uh, you know, I think you can probably look to characters, parts uh, throughout cinematic history. You know, is, is Han Solo so charming if, if and lovable if, Han, if Harrison Ford isn't playing him? I don't know. So, it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there's – you're always – I think uh, playing with that with that um, balancing act. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So just to be clear here, so you had like an idea for the script, you pitched it to Hugh Grant, he said, yeah, I'd love to do it, and then you went and wrote the script, or you had a draft of the script, and then you went and rewrote it, knowing that he would be playing the character. Uh, with, with, in this specific case, uh, I told Hugh about the idea, and he said, that sounds interesting. He never commits to anything with me or with anyone, as far as I know, without reading a script. So I could have written the entire script, and he could have read it and said, yeah, it's unfortunately not for me. So, which is which is completely fine, because I want actors to want to be in a film because they like the script, uh, not just because we're friends or pals or we got along well at lunch. So... Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. he knew about the idea. And if he had said, no, that idea is just not appealing to me, then I probably would have written the film anyway and just not have written it specifically for Hugh. But when he said, yeah, that sounds interesting, that just meant if, you know, if I like the script when I see it, then I will do the movie. So that was that was how this one worked. And actually, mm-hmm. I would say that's how all of them that Hugh and I have done together have worked. There was never any kind of arrangement or understanding before he read the script. He, he might have known about the basic idea, but uh, there was absolutely no commitment. And, and I actually, as I said, I prefer it that way. You want, you want actors to do a script because they're excited about that role and that part and not as an obligation or a favor or, or trading off of a friendship. Yeah, yeah, sure. So a lot of people, um, you know, that listen to this podcast, obviously, they're trying to get into the business, they're potentially mm-hmm. struggling trying to get their stuff out there. And one of the big thematic questions asked in this script, and you touched upon it in the pitch is this sort of idea of nature versus nurture. And I wonder if we talk about we could talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, as someone who's been in the business for years, sort of what are your, you know, actual thoughts on that? Can someone, you know, with maybe seemingly marginal talent actually succeed? as a screenwriter? Um, I guess, you know, the movie has that debate, and and I'm not exactly sure where I come out on it because I think it's sort of an unanswerable question, and one of the reasons, hopefully, that the movie is fun and entertaining, um, and Marissa's character is sort of on one side of the argument a little bit more, and Hugh's character on the other. I think there's there's got to be some baseline of talent without which it's going to be very difficult to make things work. 
Um, I don't know what that is or how you quantify it, and obviously it's subjective. And I guess occasionally there have been instances where people have a story, either something they've gone through in their life or something that uh, someone they know has gone through, which is so unique and so special that uh, even without necessarily being a very skilled screenwriter, the potential for that story is powerful enough that your script's going to get bought, in which case you probably will wind up being rewritten. But, I, I, but I'm sure that can happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that – so the, I, I don't know what the level of talent is. I don't think you can make – it. I, I guess for me the best analogy is music. Um, which um, I'm a failed musician, so I can speak well to this. And my son mm-hmm. is, is an accomplished musician. He wrote the entire score to the film, so I, I get to see it at home. If you don't have an ear for music, I don't think there's any any way to teach that. I just don't. You can discuss all the theory you want to discuss and read all the books, and it just it's just not going to happen. So I think if you don't have an ear for screenwriting, um, it's going to be very difficult to make it happen. If you do and you love it, then I think you can absolutely get better and more skilled at it. And I think that you know, I know there's wonderful books out there and teachers out there, and I'm sure that's all great. I didn't I didn't have that experience in becoming a writer. I still think that at the end of the day, the best school for any writer is watching as many movies and or TV shows and or both that you love that inspire you and watching them again and again because I think that stuff sinks in by osmosis and I think that you start to learn what works and what doesn't work by watching those and analyzing them and where do the act breaks come and how do they handle this kind of thing and then the other thing is just to rewrite never uh, don't be easy on yourself because no one else will be easy on you I mean the wonderful thing about writing is that it's as democratic as anything that any profession that I can think of, uh, you can live in a you know missile silo in North Dakota. If you write a script and someone reads it in L.A. and they feel like it's an interesting story and something that they can sell and people will be engaged in, you're in good shape. It doesn't matter what you look like or what your name is or what your connections are. So in that sense, it's a wonderfully democratic uh, profession. But they're going to be hard on it, so you have to be hard on it. You have to write and rewrite and show it to people who you trust. They can. It's great if they're writers or they have experience in the business, but even if they don't, if they're just smart people, let them read it and listen. You don't have to agree, but listen when they tell you this doesn't make sense or this is boring or I didn't think this was funny or I don't like this character, and then go back and and try more stuff. And if you can, take whatever you've written and hear it read aloud. It's great if you have friends who are actors or work in a theater group, but even if you don't, get relatives together and sit around a table and read it out loud because it's going to sound different and you're going to learn things about it that you can never learn if you're just hearing it in your head. And uh, the biggest thing is if you're a writer, there's just no shortcuts. Either you're writing or you're not working. So um, I think you, whether you write alone or with a partner, it's uh, it's it's just spending the time doing it. It's wrestling with it. It's 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 weeping. It's wanting to kill yourself or throw it out the window, and then going back to it and talking to whoever will listen to you. So it's uh, it's all of that stuff. And in terms of whether you have the talent to do it, ultimately, it that won't be your decision. Someone else will probably tell you. But if you love it. And you feel, and you know, writers write. That's, I mean, Woody Allen said that writers write the way institutionalized people basket weave, and I think that that's absolutely true. If you find yourself needing to write and going down every day and and, and whatever constitutes your office or where you write and doing it every day, then you're a writer, and and uh, there's no shortcut around that. There's scripts don't come out of out of thin air you've got to be there and wrestle with them so um it's a, probably a long and not uh not 
relevant answer to your question. No, I think that's I think that's a great answer. I think that's inspiring um, for people. Um, so let's go on. Um, one of the other big big things in this movie was, you know, obviously it's a story about a screenwriter who's kind of on the downward trajectory. And you know, watching this movie and knowing I'm going to interview you, I wonder, you know, how much of this is based on sort of your own experience. And I'd be curious just to hear, kind of, obviously, you know, you had a big hit in 2000 with Miss Congeniality. Um, you know, one of the biggest movies of the year. And I just, mm-hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what does a career, a, a successful screenwriting career look at, um, you know, 10 or 15 years after a big hit like that? Um, and just, you know, some surprises, some things that might surprise an audience, um, you know, of people listening, trying to get into this profession. Are there some things that surprise you after having the kind of success you've had? Um, well, you know, after Miss Congeniality, things, um, we did a, the first film I directed was, and wrote was Two Weeks Notice, and that turned out to be very successful, and then music and lyrics after that was, was also quite successful and, and well received. And then we did one called Did You Hear About the Morgans, which was not. And so that was, uh, and, you know, an experience, I guess, that informed this uh, a little bit. I mean, honestly, from people who meet me and ask what I've done, I hear about probably music and lyrics more than anything, including Miss Congeniality. So things went, you know, there was a long stri- And before that, the this movie, Forces of Nature, was successful. So things are, you know, I was very, very lucky to have things going well. Um, when you have one that doesn't go well, it's definitely... An, an interesting experience and not one that you're looking forward to, but uh, so it hasn't been exactly the experience uh, that Hugh's character had where there, you know, where there was just this one thing and then nothing else. And Hugh's character also wasn't a director, which is a whole other aspect of life in Hollywood. So, um, but I don't know anybody who's done it for any length of time. And I've been doing it, God, uh, it's horrifying to say, for 30 years now. I've been, um, from the time I started on Family Ties. So I'm thrilled to still be here doing it because um, it's a hard town to keep working in for that -hmm. that long in, in some ways. But I don't think anyone who's doing it hasn't experienced the kind of, you know, waves of, oh, everything's going great, everybody wants me, oh, nothing's going great, nobody wants me. I think it's just part of life in in town. I mean, William Bill Goldman, um, you know, in, in his books would do that great thing of writing, you know, the top stars from any decade, and it was always interesting to see how few went from decade to decade, you know, um, would, would, would last, you know, with that kind of star power for a period of time. So that's just part of what that world is. And it's part of life moving on. And it's part of, you know, it's, it's, uh, sort of what you sign up for. And at the end of the day, I think all that matters is you're following your instincts. I mean, it's great to have hits and it's great to make money and everyone needs to do that on some level, but, um, no one, I don't know anybody who started writing just so that they could make a lot of money and, and have hits. I mean, that that's, you know, everyone dreams of that, but I think you write because you love to tell stories and you love the process of writing and it's who you are. So regardless of how well or how badly things have gone, uh, you what's great about writing is you wind up in that room by yourself wrestling with your own demons, and I think it's a way to sort of keep pure and the thing that you have to or I feel like I have to do is to to stick to to be open enough to what changes in the world because things do change in the world and you want to you know be open to new influences and seeing new things and seeing what other people are doing because that most most writers are inspired by other writers and other films and think oh I want to do that so you always need to keep those channels open, but at the same time, not trying to follow trends, because if you're trying to do what whoever the hot new person is, you know, trying to do that, they're probably doing it better than, than you can. And in five or 10 years or three years, actually, or a year in Hollywood, someone else will be doing the next new thing. So you need to kind of, uh, follow your instincts and do it for the reason that, that you got into it. So, um, I, you know, I think anybody working, virtually anyone you could name, no matter how big they are, can absolutely tell you about 
the time in their career where the phone didn't ring and nobody wanted them and they couldn't sell a script and, 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 and that sort of thing. And I think that level of insecurity is always just uh, a half an inch away for everyone in Hollywood, regardless of how big you are, I would say. Um, and and uh, that's it's unsettling, but it's also, I guess, part of what keeps you alive and vibrant and striving and wanting to do better on 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 the next thing. So, mm-hmm. let's just go back for a second. You were talking about um, sort of the writing process. Maybe just quickly take us through, um, you know, a script like the rewrite. Take us through the process. You mentioned, you know, showing it to as many people as you can. You know, getting actors to read it. Um, I think it might be interesting for our audience to see what someone like yourself, who's been doing this for years, what they do with the script once they're done that first draft. Just walk us through that, if you don't mind. Well, for me, it's a little bit easier because uh, I'm, you know, there was a deal in place, and I was getting paid to write the script, and so the producers, uh, in this case, who I've worked with many times, uh, Castle Rock, who we did, you know, everything from Miss Congeniality on, uh, they're there commenting on each draft, so I'm immediately getting feedback um, from the time I hand in the first draft, and I they see it before Hugh sees it, so I get their feedback, and then we work together. And then, uh, you know, send it to Hugh and he'll have notes and thoughts. And then you send the script out to actors. And when you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to get them on board, which in this case we we did, then you, my version of hearing it read aloud was with most of the actual cast. Uh, mm-hmm. I think everyone in all the major parts made it to, to the reading. And so you're sitting around a table and you're hearing it read, and it's it's that that's a very important part of the process for me because you don't have any of the advantages that movies give you. You don't have music, and you can't edit, and you're not seeing you know fun visuals and able to cut back and forth between things. It's movies in a certain sense are not meant to be read aloud around the table. So it to me it means if it's working around the table you have a fair shot at making it work in the film. And if it's not, it's a great way to sort of try to, to, to highlight that and try to figure out what isn't working because mm-hmm. it'll be easy. It's too late to really fix it in a, in a huge fundamental way once it's up on its feet because, you know, you're just trying to then make the movie and deal with that. And I've had an instance of a reading, I think, sort of saving a film for me where hearing it read, I was really unhappy. But there were a couple of moments in the script that worked that uh, this was not not much before we actually started shooting the film where I was able to sort of circle those little moments and say, that's what this needs to be. And then went back and locked myself in a hotel room and wrote for three or four days went through the entire script, uh, didn't change much structurally, but character-wise, an an enormous change. And I think that was, you know, resulted in that movie being relatively successful. So without the reading, I think we would have been just out shooting what was there, and I don't think it would have worked nearly as well. Yeah. So just to wrap up, maybe you can tell us how can people see the rewrite? Do you have some release dates, um, you know, when it where it's going to be playing and, and when it'll hit the video on demand and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's open opens on the 13th in the select cities around the country. Um, I'm sure it's in I know it's in L.A. somewhere. Okay. Um, and and then uh, it's on uh, it's also available on the 13th on video on demand and uh, it's iTunes right yes and on iTunes and uh, and and uh, and that sort of stuff so you can definitely see it on the 13th and any perfect, point perfect. on from the 13th yes and what's a good way for people to just keep up with you um, do you have a Twitter handle or a Facebook page a blog anything you want I to give don't. out someone I'm just really to I'm, I'm really a, a, a ludite in terms of those I don't do Facebook <laughs> right. and, and I don't do Twitter unfortunately um, so uh, the the only way to really keep up is to uh, come by the apartment or to <laughs> <laughs> great or, what's your what's or, your address or, we'll send some people or, over there <laughs> Or just wait for the next film you can. I'll put in a plug that you can keep up with uh, my son Clyde, who's 21 and who wrote the all the the score for the film and has been working with me. He actually wrote the theme song to Miss Congeniality when he was six. 
Um, he uh, he has a band called the Clyde Lawrence Band that is very popular in touring colleges and on college radio stations, and you can keep up with him. And he has stuff about the rewrite up on his uh, Facebook uh, page. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll link to that in the show notes. Okay, perfect. Well, Mark, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate this. Lots of great information. Um, I wish you luck with this movie. I really enjoyed it, and I think um, the audience will too. It's a great movie for for writers, and that's that's definitely the audience of this podcast. Terrific, Ashley. I really appreciate it. I enjoy talking to you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you later. A quick plug for my upcoming class. I'm going to be teaching another SYS Select class called Writing a Great Second Act for Your Screenplay. The second act is usually the most difficult part of writing the screenplay. It can be a real slog. Obviously, the first act and the third act are incredibly important. But if your second act doesn't work, your script is going to be dead in the water. So if you're having trouble with the second act, definitely check out this class. I'm going to be giving numerous tips and tricks about how to get through the second act and make it all work. I'm going to be reviewing the second Second acts from Legally Blonde and Back to the Future. Both are these are excellent scripts, and both of them have excellent second acts. So there's a lot of lessons we can learn from them. <clears throat> I'm someone who really learns by seeing actual examples, so that's what I'll be doing in this class with these two scripts. Is really trying to illustrate the points that I make. The class is going to take place on Saturday, March 7th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So if you'd like to learn more about this class, go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. Also, if you're listening to this after the class has taken place, no problem. I will record the class, too, and put it in the SYS Select forum. In fact, all the classes that have been taught are recorded and are in the forum for SYS members to listen to. There's more than a dozen classes in there now. To learn more about SYS Select, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Com. Again, though, if you'd like to sign up for this particular class or learn more about it, go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. In the next episode of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Adam Green. Adam is a writer and director, and he even acts in some of his films. He's written and directed films like Hatchet and Hatchet 2. We talk about how he got his start in the business and how he got his latest film, Digging Up the Marrow, made. I mentioned in the last episode that, that, would, that Adam would actually be in today's episode, and I ended up switching it. The rewrite is out before Adam's new film, so they got switched around. Anyway, though, I promise the next episode will be Adam Green, so keep an eye out for that next week. So there, there were a lot of great takeaways from this episode with Mark. One of the big things I wrestle with myself is this issue of how much of screenwriting can be taught versus how much can be learned. Obviously, I teach screenwriting classes, so at least on some level, I believe that it can be taught or at least can be taught to some people. I consider myself a lifelong learner, too. I learn a tremendous amount from interviewing these guests on the podcast. I still feel like I'm getting better as a screenwriter, learning new stuff, and I think the material I'm writing now is better than the stuff I was writing even three or five years ago. So I definitely believe that there's a big, you know, there's a lot you can learn and you can always get better. But I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. So what do you think about this? Check out any of the social media platforms and let me know what you think. You can leave comments on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or just tweet me something like, um, just tweet me something about this and um, use hashtag SYS62. And let's start a discussion. Um, you can find us on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash selling your screenplay. It's on YouTube. Um, check out our YouTube channel. Just leave a comment and let me know where you fall. Can screenwriting be taught or do you need to be born with the talent to do it? Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.